Mount Everest is in trouble and I want to know what's being done about it. Every year in April and May, when all the climbers, the guides, the Sherpa, the porters go to the mountain, there's too much garbage and too much human waste. And people are angry and upset and they should be. We're talking about the Nepal side, the south side of the mountain. Essentially, it's none of my business what Nepal does with their mountain, but Mount Everest is part of the environment. It's part of the earth, and I think we all have a stake in its future. And with the overt commercialization of the mountain making it easier for inexperienced climbers to climb the mountain, as they call the tourist climbers of the mountain, it's only going to get worse in the future unless something is done about it. Well, the government of Nepal has stepped up to the plate and they are going to enact some new regulations that could and should change things up the mountain. Namely, climbers and guides will be required to carry their own human waste back down the mountain. They will be issuing thousands of bags, two per climber that can be used four or five times apparently, and those bags will be carried back down the mountain and disposed of properly so there's no more human waste accumulating up the mountain. And in another surprising and controversial change that is supposedly coming in 2024 is the local Kumbu municipality has said they want to put strict regulations on luxuries on the mountain. Now I'll dive into that later in the video, but essentially they're saying that the large dome tents, the single tents in base camp that have their own private bathrooms have to go. I'm going to get into why I think that that is happening. I've got some information from a prominent guide, expedition company owner on the mountain who's weighed in on why he thinks this is happening. We're going to find that out today. So let's get into it. In today's video, I'm going to go into the background, just how bad is the problem on Mount Everest and what has been done in the past to reverse the accumulation of garbage and human waste on the mountain. And that also includes the bodies that are left up there. I'll discuss the new regulations that have been proposed and supposedly will be enacted in 2024. We'll get some input from an expedition owner, a friend of mine, Mike Hamill, from Climbing the Seven Summits, who's weighed in on the situation regarding luxuries on the mountain. And then I'll wrap it up and give my overall analysis and prediction about how that's going to go on the mountain and what the future looks like on Mount Everest moving forward. Before we get into all of that, please take a moment to subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified every time an awesome video like this comes out. And also, I hope you'll take a moment to check out the membership of Everest Mystery. Click the join button and it will give you two tiers of membership. All of them welcome you into a community of like-minded individuals who are interested not only about Mount Everest, but about mountains around the world and tragedies that take place there and hopefully what we can learn from those tragedies, but also the great successes and the beautiful things that we love about Mount Everest and all the mountains of the world. All right, so before we get into the history of this, we're talking about the Nepal, the south side of the mountain. This is where these problems have accumulated over the years. This is not in regard to Tibet or the Chinese northern side of the mountain. They have been incredible stewards of the mountain, have no qualms whatsoever about closing the mountain for whatever reason they have and limiting access to the mountain. In the last several years, they've only allowed Chinese nationals on the mountain. In fact, not only have they only allowed Chinese nationals on the mountain, but those allowed had to prove that they had previous 8,000 meter peak experience. So even Chinese nationals without 8,000 meter peak experience went across the border and attempted to get their Everest summit on the Nepal side. And that's why we're seeing such an influx of Chinese climbers on the Nepal side. I've been on Everest on four separate occasions, twice on the south and twice on the north. And the one takeaway I've had on the north is it is a much 
cleaner mountain. They do not like things being left behind, even wrappers or a plastic bottle on the trek up to advanced base camp is a very rare sight indeed. They are also known to not like bodies being left behind. They have closed the mountain, say for instance 2008 before the Beijing Olympics. They literally closed the mountain to clean it and remove bodies from the mountain. Those things are starting to change on the Nepal side of the mountain, but it has always been known that China does not like dead bodies on the mountain. Honestly, I don't think they care who the dead person is. They just don't like it to be seen or be in the background or foreground of a video shot of anybody who's taking pictures or film footage of the mountain on their side. So, in a recent video, as you know, I did an interview with Jamie McGinnis about the body of Sandy Irvin, supposedly having been removed from the mountain many years ago. And everybody is thinking, oh my gosh, is there a conspiracy? Why did the body get removed? The thing is, I don't think they care who the body is. They just want all the bodies off and out of view. So whether they take them down the mountain and dispose of them or burn them in a funeral pyre or throw them down the mountain where they'll be hidden in a crevasse or way at the bottom of the north face is not known. But they just do not like to see bodies and garbage and human waste on the mountain. Mount Everest has long been a symbol of human achievement and a stark reminder of the human environmental footprint. It has also become a focal point for people's ire and anger when they see, uh, if you will, a human turd on the mountain. They're like, how dare those selfish Everest climbers actually take a crap on the side of the mountain? Meanwhile, there's garbage on the side of the road where they're driving, plastic bottles and beer cans tossed on the side, and McDonald's bags, and nobody seems to say anything about that, but rightly so. Everest is a focal point and gains a lot of attention and rightly so is put under a microscope for the good and the bad things that take place there. In an interview I did with Dan Mazur, he is a prominent guide on the mountain. A couple of years ago for a video I did with Musa Masala, one of the friends of the Everest Mystery Channel, Dan Mazur has guided on the mountain for many years and was alarmed at just how much human waste and garbage was being left behind. And so he instituted this program. He formed a foundation called the Everest Biogas Project. And in it, he talks about the 26,000 pounds of human waste that are created on the mountain every year. 26,000 pounds, which I believe is about 13,000 kg or so. That is a lot of human waste on the mountain. And now if we were to take a wide shot of the mountain, so here is a graphic of Mount Everest from the south side. And you can see base camp at the bottom and the line going up shows the route where the climbers are. When people hear about the garbage and human waste problems and even the dead bodies on the mountain, Perhaps in their mind, they think that the entire mountain is covered in garbage and human waste. The truth is, it's focused in just a few different areas, namely base camp. However, because of base camp's easy accessibility, garbage and human waste is carried out and disposed of some ways down the valley. Passing camp one up to camp two, there are tents set up with their own latrine inside and large buckets lined with heavy garbage bags, and those are carried down every year. Where the human waste accumulation and the garbage accumulation is higher up on the mountain where we're starting to enter a place called the death zone, so camp three, halfway up the Lhotse face and then up to camp four, 26,000 feet or about 8,000 meters. This is where it's extremely difficult just to walk or put your boots on. So this is where a lot of the accumulation of the garbage and human waste takes place, or notably one might see a body frozen until someone put a specific effort to go through the lengths required to actually remove a frozen body. In an interview I did with David Leonio Gonzalez, he spoke emphatically 
about the problem he sees with many people going to Mount Everest today who aren't interested really in Everest itself or keeping it clean or, or whether they leave garbage behind or not. He literally said with his own words that all they really care about is getting their summit photo and getting the hell back down. David Leonio Gonzalez has been to Everest many times, has summited seven separate times, and has gone through great lengths, not only to carry his own garbage out, but ahead of the curve to take plastic bags to carry his own human waste out. First up on the changes for 2024 is that the government of Nepal has hoped to slow the accumulation of human waste on the mountain or stop the accumulation of it entirely by handing out two wag bags to each climber. A wag bag is an acronym that stands for waste alleviating gel. So essentially when you deposit your waste in the bag. There's something already in it that, if you will, neutralizes the feces and starts a process of breaking it down. Reportedly, 8,000 bags have been ordered, which will allow each climber or guide to carry two with him or her up the mountain. Each bag supposedly takes four or five different uses. I don't even know how to say that. So each bag supposedly can be used four or five different times. And then that bag needs to come back down. And because this is still so new, I'm not even sure what's going to happen with those bags. If they'll be deposited where the main deposit for human waste is at Gorak Shep near Everest Base Camp, or if they'll be deposited or burned in a different way. I'll report to you on that when I find more information on it. And so as I said a little bit earlier, at base camp there are small privies or bathrooms with a bucket built underneath it. And that bucket is lined with a very thick plastic bag. And those buckets leave base camp or come down to base camp on the backs of porters and are disposed of at an open pit near Gorik Shep that one wouldn't see unless they were going to specifically look for it. I have pictures and footage of it from my talks with Dan Mazur, who is working on the Everest biogas project. Mazur tells me that each year there are 25 or 26,000 pounds of human waste created, if you will, at base camp. That's about 12,000 kg of untreated human waste. And so when Mazur put together this Everest biogas project, what his intent is, is to implement long-term sustainable solutions that ensure the safe disposal of the increasing environmental and human health hazard created by the human waste up there. And he launched it in 2010. And I'm, he's not the only one that gets credit for it. There are other people. I'll put the link to the Everest Biogas Project in the notes of this video. But the Everest Mount Everest Biogas Project basically will eliminate the annual dumping of all that solid human waste at the Tea House Village of Gorik Shep. It will lessen the risk, very importantly, of water contamination by fecal coli. And in the biogas project, what it would do, it would be converting the waste into a renewable natural gas in the form of methane that would be made available to the local community for cooking and for lighting. And a lot of the porters who travel back to Gorik Shep during the night would benefit from that greatly and would also be hired to participate in the operation and building of the biogas project. Now, where is the biogas project now? They're looking for funding to actually build it. Seems like there's plenty of money out there for people to climb the mountain, but the several hundred thousand dollars that are still required is really essentially the reason that the biogas gas project has not been completed. Again, I'm going to put a link to that in the notes if you're interested in finding out more of it and reaching out to Dan Mazur or getting more information through me. By all means, reach out via the link that I'll put in the notes to this video. So before we move on to the luxuries at base camp that they are hoping to curtail, 
I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. Do you think people will actually bring out their own human waste or if when nobody's looking, they're going to throw their bag in a crevasse or off trail where nobody sees it? I'm really curious. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. So now moving on to stop the extravagances. With the commercialization of Mount Everest, base camp has gotten bigger and bigger over the years. And as you've seen in some of my shorts and videos, the luxuries that are provided at base camp by some of the expedition operators have become incredible. Honestly, I find myself in some form of envy because if I did have the bank account that would allow me to go to the top Top dollar to go climb Mount Everest, I'd love to have a bed that was up off the ground and have a little sitting area or my own private privy. I don't have any problem whatsoever with that. And I also think having a TV screen in base camp in a large dome tent is totally cool. I don't see why people find the need to criticize these luxuries. Metaphorically, I guess the way you could say it is if your budget is to stay at a at a small hotel, like in the United States, we have the Red Roof Inn, which is an affordable, low budget, but clean hotel. When you're driving down the street, if you see somebody across the street at a five-star hotel, like Park Plaza or, or you know, the Sheraton Hyatt in Regency or something, you don't flip them the bird and say, screw you, you rich people, you dogs, you. But for some reason, when people see that there are individuals with luxuries on the mountain, it really does bring the ire out. It doesn't give me a problem whatsoever. And so I'll make a suggestion afterwards, but first let me break down just what these new regulations are being proposed to curb the amount of luxuries at base camp. About a week ago, there was a public document released called Base Camp Management Procedure 2024. Now, I read about this for the first time in Explorer's Web in an article written by my friend Angela Benavides. It said, while there are technical issues and some fine tuning needed, the basis of the document has been approved for the upcoming spring season. Now, Keep in mind, this video is being done in February. People are leaving in a matter of weeks. So any regulations other than maybe handing out wag bags to climbers is going to be significant in terms of it changing the game for people. All the deposits are in. The money has been spent by the expedition operators. So. Here are the things that they say that they want to stop in terms of the extravagances on the mountain. Individual tents with furniture and in-suite bathrooms, huge lounge domes, bakeries and massive parlors that thrive on the Kumbu Glacier while helicopters are going up and down constantly are going to be curtailed. These new rules have been put forth by Sherpa mayors of the Kumbu Valley. And what they're saying is that these base camp infrastructures will help lessen the environmental impact on base camp and Mount Everest as a whole, as well as trying to preserve local culture, lifestyle, and economy. Now, to me, I'll be honest with you, I think that's a real stretch because I don't see why a large dome tent is any different than a small tent at base camp. Whether a person stays in the big tent or a little tent, he or she is still going to take a crap once a day and urinate several times a day, eat the same amount of food, things of that nature. So it's kind of a stretch. However, let's give it its just due. I'll go over the regulations and let you know. So one thing, they want to say goodbye to the big dome tents. One of the main changes, it limits the size of these tents, these dining tents, and then the toilets that are attached to individual tents will disappear. And the number of tents per camp will be reduced and the use of flashing lights will cease. They don't like that anyway. I, I say good luck enforcing it. Extravagant for one is roughing it to another. But anyway, Mike Hamill of Climbing the Seven Summits, a friend of mine, I met him on Everest in 2014 when he was working with International Mountain Guides. He went on to start his own company, Climbing the Seven Summits, has written the book called Climbing the Seven Summits, has been to the summit of Everest seven times and all the other seven summits numerous times. 
he offers some of the most incredible packages for climbers on his expeditions. And now I'll show you some pictures on the screen here that show and feature some of the offerings for the higher priced budgeted climbers going on the mountain. Here they are, the in-suite bathrooms, the beds raised up, a little carpet on the floor. Uh, man, that looks really good if you ask me. And I don't have any problem with that. I actually think that if I had the dough, I'd do that too. I don't think you need to sleep on a cold ground on, at Everest Base Camp in order to be really prepared to go climb the mountain up high. Because the minute you leave Base Camp, it's going to be pretty much roughing it all the way. I emailed Mike because I said, Mike, what do you think about this? Is this going to really work? And do you think it's fair? How is this really going to change things, especially on such short notice. Now, I'm not going to read you the whole thing that Mike sent me, but in essence, this is what he shared with me regarding these new rules about extravagances or luxuries at base camp. Mike says that climbing the seven summits and many of the other Everest operators and expedition organizers have always been advocates for protecting the environment and culture of the Kumbu and Everest region. I know that to be an absolute fact. He also said, we pioneered using sustainable energy at base camp with a huge solar array and battery banks, and they've always invested in the leave no trace principles, both on the trek in at base camp and on the upper mountain. He's invested a lot of money into training for the local community, supporting families through the Tiger of the Snows Fund, which is a nonprofit that helps families of workers on the mountain who have lost their lives. Incredible organization. He says, and I am with him on this all the way, we're one of the good guys constantly striving to do our bit for industry improvement, not only in camps on Everest, but across mountaineering in general all around the world. So Mike says, these restrictions have been dropped on our lap with absolutely no discussion or consultation with us as a key player in the industry and absolutely no warning a mere six weeks out from the expedition. Unfortunately, the way the restrictions are structured, we can only take them as a direct attack on our business versus a realistic, positive, and constructive way to lessen the environmental impact of the industry, which we have always been at the forefront of. He also asked that it would be helpful for businesses like Climbing the Seven Summits to understand exactly how these last minute restrictions are going to actually preserve the culture and environment and how they're supposed to be implemented, who is making these decisions for the entire industry without input from the operators they target. So what he's saying is suddenly these rules got sent along Who's enforcing it? If you put the dome tent up or you put the individual tents up with the in-suite bathrooms in them, is somebody gonna come and give you a fine, take them down, remove the tents? Are you gonna be arrested? There's no conversation about this whatsoever. Usually things like this should be a year in the making where a collaborative with all the guides and the locals and the expedition owners would come to a manageable agreement as to ways to move forward. So as he said, this really does get slapped in their laps really fast with short notice and seems to me pretty unfair. Here's where it does get a little bit juicy. He says, it doesn't seem like the motives behind these proposed regulations are clear enough for the purpose that they purport to be. To be honest, it seems like to a simple way to attack businesses like ours, which attract climbers and trekkers who want more comforts. And these are provided to them, which in turn gives them the ability to ultimately bring more money to the local economy through greater employment, influence how our clientele interact with the environment in a positive, more sustainable way. My understanding is that much of this is being lobbied for by tea house owners in Namche Bazaar, who are afraid not as many climbers will drop back down the valley to use their services before the summit rotation, and by local outfitters that don't want competition from higher end services that they find it difficult to compete with, so they resort to guerrilla tactics. To be honest, this just feels like a slap in the face and makes us question operating in Nepal, where attacks disguised as regulations are imposed arbitrarily at the last minute. 
It seems like a common tactic used by Nepali operators to hinder, hinder competition. Anyway, so there you have it. There's the regulations that are being imposed and we have no idea how this is gonna shake down. My gut, if I were an expedition owner, I would bring it all in. If somebody already paid for it, I'd set the tent up and be ready to react on a moment by moment uh, notice and see how it all shakes down. I think it's actually totally lame. And, and one of the things that I can tell you, climbers often do like to drop down into the valley to rest for a few days before they go on their summit bid. And one of the things that even the biggest dome tent or the most incredible flat screen TV with all the amenities cannot provide is the thicker air of the lower altitude. So these large accommodations and luxurious accommodations really don't have a bearing on that. So in terms of the analysis, my feeling about the wag bags, I think the idea of individuals carrying their own feces, their own human waste out in bags that they bring back down to base camp is an absolutely on point idea. I hope that it works. I am eagerly anticipating to see that it becomes a success and that now that everybody is going to be put on notice essentially uh, that they have to carry their own human waste out, it should make a big difference. In terms of the extravagances and the luxuries on the mountain, my thoughts are is that one way to get around this, now it's too late for it to happen this year would be that there would be a collaborative that would get together all the expedition operators, every single one of them that's going to the mountain each year, to get together with a group of representatives from all the businesses and tea houses in the nearby area from base camp and come to a determination of that perhaps there's a fund that can support these local communities so that they're not dramatically disaffected by what they perceive to be uh, the, the impact of luxuries and extravagances. So one way to do it, now this might not be popular with the really wealthy people who go to the mountain, would be that the more luxuries that you purchase, perhaps there would be like a luxury tax, if you will. So let's say you spend another $1,000, 10% uh, on top of that $1,000 would go into a fund that would support tea houses in the valley or, or a group of tea houses or something like that. So if you can pay, let's say, $150,000 or $200,000 to climb Everest, you probably can afford another $5,000 more that goes into a fund that benefits all the businesses in the area. I don't know, what do you think of that? Do you think that seems like a good idea? Do you think all luxuries should stop? Myself, personally, I think it's awesome. I think that there are all different types of people from all different strata of society. There are people who save for many years to go to Mount Everest and can barely come up with the, say, $35,000 that it takes to go there, right on up to some of the most wealthy people who can afford $150,000 or $200,000. I feel like each person should be able to buy or, or spend money according to whatever their own level of possibilities are. So what do you think? Do you think that these changes are good? I'd love to hear your thoughts and put them in the comments below. And most importantly, thank you for being here, for taking time out of your day. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and also do somebody a favor today. Don't look for anything in return. Make the world a better place one day at a time. Be well, my friends, and thank you.